Hi there, and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome my guest, Mark Maslin, the Professor of Climatology from the University College London, and the author of a brand new book called How to Save Our Planet, The Facts. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Brilliant, and thank you for having me back. It's always great to have a chat with you. Yeah, it's awesome to have you back too, and I'm glad that we're able to do this like mini-series, if you like, between us. For me, it's all about communicating with lots of different people and engaging. And again, I think this is one of the key things about climate change. If we can talk about it and actually find solutions, that's going to be great. And yeah, thank you so much for being vocal about this. Um, It's such an important topic that we all need to get into gear with. So I think looking at your book, um, what made you decide to write such a unique book? Well, I think many of us have picked up books in the past, and these are tomes that tell you how bad it is and how evil we are and things like that. And then they might have at the back one chapter that says, oh, but there's some things we can do to save the planet. And I suddenly realized that these are worthy books, okay? And I have to hold my hand up. I have actually written a couple of those worthy books And I was frustrated. It's like, how do we really communicate this to normal people? I I wanted a book that my mates that I play football with would pick up and go, oh, I understand this, Mark. Oh, this is actually okay. I, I get this. And that's what I was really trying to do. So this is why I was trying to find a completely different way of communicating. And how did The Art of War by Sun Tzu influence your writing style? Uh, So I love this, that I was influenced by a book that's two and a half thousand years old. And so uh, a bit like you, I listen to lots of podcasts and sort of like um, videos of colleagues. And I was listening to In Our Time by Melvin Bragg on the BBC. And they picked one of my favorite books, The Art of War. Now, for people that don't know this book, The Art of War was written two and a half thousand years ago by Sun Tzu's or a group of people and what it does is tell you how to fight a war and it's written in very simple uh, sentences and very straightforward things like have more spies than the enemy do not put men on ridge with some behind do not attack unless you can win and guess what the sort of uh, the US Marine Corps and the British Army have it as their key text so I have three copies okay i i i went through a phase okay i've got three copies of it so <laughs> and i realized that it was really very straightforward and easy to read so i thought well hang on why don't i write a whole book like this no so this is why the book is written in single sentences or sometimes double sentences which basically give you facts and give you things you can do straightforward without all that waffle and so i wrote this and i have to say my and my editor and my agent at first just went, sorry, <laughs> I, I don't get it. So I had to write a couple of chapters before they went, oh. And I was very lucky that when we sent it out, Penguin just literally bit my hand off and went, this is something completely different. This will be great. And for me, I then went through it. And when I was editing it, I suddenly realized that, okay, I've been influenced by a book two and a half thousand years old. But actually, I'd written this giant, long Twitter thread. And so weirdly, I'd written a book that was socially media savvy uh, by accident. So that's how the book turned out. Yeah. And um, it's a fantastic book. I mean, I know you say in the beginning that you don't have to read it linearly. Um, I actually did and managed to finish it, in, I think, less than two days. <laughs> Um, so it's it's a great little uh, you know little snippets of information which is just fantastic to know about. For me, I wanted to write a book that you didn't have to start at the beginning and go to the end, and I think that really plays into how societies change. We would dive into a TikTok video or a YouTube video or a middle of a soap opera, and then we'll go backwards and forwards to catch up. And I think that's something that we haven't really got to grips with within communication. And so what it is, is if you pick up my book and you say, I'm an individual, I I, I just want to know what to do. You go straight to chapter six. And then I'm hoping that that will enthuse you to go to other chapters. If 
you happen to be a CEO and you're struggling with people who are incredibly passionate and saying, we must do this, and you're going, I have no idea what they're talking about. You go to chapter seven, go, oh, thank God Mark's actually helping me here. What do I need to do as a CEO to keep them happy? You know, And so I think that's why I wrote the book. And then, of course, there's that chapter which um, Penguin were really passionate about. And they said, look, a lot of people want to have a chapter to help them with climate deniers because they say everybody's got that person in their family or that mate down the pub that goes, oh, no, it's all made up, and, you know, I've read in the Daily Mail, and this is rubbish. And those people I call honest deniers, because it's they're not denying it because they care about the actual sort of politics or the denial. It's just that they don't have enough information, and they just haven't been inspired. So that's why there's Chapter 4, which gives you all those things to hammer away at your mates or your uncle that basically goes, oh, no, it's rubbish. So sticking with the deniers then, um, what statistic um, do you think that climate deniers struggle to defend? So the new mantra of climate deniers is it is too expensive to fix climate change. And we'll be seeing this both in the States and in the UK, that that part of uh, the right wing will start to bring this mantra back, which is we just can't afford it. And actually... The big stat that I always say was like, hang on, the world generates $88 trillion per year. It also makes me wonder why we have poor people. Okay, So that's really important stat. Also, our world GDP grows by 3% every single year. Absolutely brilliant. However, the economists, these are the hard-nosed uh, economists, okay? These aren't sweet, happy uh, tree huggers, okay? These are hardcore economists. They say, to fix climate change now will cost us maximum of 1% of GDP. Well, hang on. GDP goes up at 3%. So we just get wealthier, or the very rich will get wealthier by 2%, not 3%. And actually, we do something really positive for the planet. There's also lots of arguments coming out from uh, economics is that actually dealing with climate change may even save us money. Because the interesting thing is if you actually reduce air pollution because you're removing uh, sort of petrol cars and diesel vehicles and you're uh, closing down coal-fired power stations, you improve people's health. And if you improve Mm. people's health, they cost less in your health service, in your medicines, and they also live longer. That's all a cost saving. And people forget that there is a real cost saving to people's health. Remember, most Western countries spend between about 11 and 16% of their GDP just on health. So any small saving there, making people healthier, makes a huge saving. The downside is the economists also say, look, if we don't fix climate change, To deal with the impacts, all the extreme weather events and all those natural disasters that we're going to precipitate in the future, by 2050, it will cost us 20% of world GDP in 2050. Remember, it's gone up by 3%. And please don't ask me to do the compound interest. I have no idea what it will be in 2050. I'm sure somebody can do it in the back uh, uh, back of their head. I can't. But that's going to be a massive amount of money that we would have to waste when actually there's better things to spend it on, like lifting people out of poverty and supporting lots of positive things around the planet. Let's take it back now. Um, At a very high level, why are we in a climate crisis right now? Our climate crisis is because we are an incredible inventive species okay we work incredibly well in teams we basically invent things and as soon as we invent things actually we copy it and so we don't all have to be geniuses we just need one person to go i've invented the mobile phone and everybody else goes oh i'll have one of them (laughs) and so that's brilliant so what happened was in britain in the midlands and the north we had the industrial revolution And this was brilliant because what it said was up to then, we had used animals and people power to actually do agriculture, create goods, etc. 
we suddenly found that there's all these minerals sort of like coal oil that we could actually burn release energy to create power and that's what we're really after humans like power in the terms of energy because then we can use it to drive factories drive vehicles etc what we didn't realize and actually it wasn't until sort of like the 1930s that we realized that actually putting that co2 into the atmosphere was causing it to warm up so it's that classic case that we do something we're incredibly inventive and then there's a downside and i think the big thing is that we've done this many times before so remember we took lead out of petrol because we realized that lead is a really bad sort of uh, pollutant and was causing problems with people's uh, brain development and also causing some toxicity. We also realized that mercury, when we had it in uh, goods and was actually putting it into wastewater, was causing birth defects. So humans learn that there are certain things that we can't actually tolerate or put into the environment. But what we've done is we've had this huge pollution event, which is we're putting greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. And we're now saying, well, hang on, that's not good. And, be and again, the thing that I, I get really shocked about is we're so inventive. We've already invented all the technology to replace fossil fuels. I mean, we've got all the renewable energies, etc., that we need. What we need now are the policies and politics to shift away from fossil fuels. But there's some really nasty things about fossil fuel companies, which means that they have embedded themselves in society and are constantly undermining our politics and um, policies. And part of that, would you say, are the subsidies? You know, currently the fossil fuel industry receives 5.2 trillion in subsidies. So that's a huge amount that is used to support these fossil fuel companies. So how do we rebalance that? So most of that money is now going to renewables. As you say, the technology is there. I think what's really interesting is we have to unpack the fossil fuel industry because people see the fossil fuel industry as Shell, VP. But actually, if you take the 25 largest fossil fuel companies in the world, 19 of them are either fully owned by a state or part owned by a state. So, of course, if you happen to uh, be a country and you own your own fossil fuel company, you can give them tax breaks. You can give them subsidies to basically produce oil, coal or natural gas at a cheaper rate than anybody else because you want that petrochemical chemical dollar coming in. And so what we have is a crisis not of, say, capitalism, but actually of nationalism. And so what we need to do is somehow break that dependency that countries have on their fossil fuel industries. And those subsidies are huge. I mean, this is these are numbers produced by the International Monetary Fund. So it's not a sort of green sort of tree huggers. These are sort of like, again, hardcore economists are saying these are ridiculous subsidies. And for me, what is interesting and the economists completely missed over the last 10 years the price of renewables has crashed and actually it's much cheaper now to go for renewables than it is fossil fuels even with their subsidies and i have to say the great experts never saw that huge decline so economics is actually playing in our favor to say even now when you're trying to subsidize this this isn't working so what we do need to do is at an international level is start to leverage change to start companies moving away from fossil fuels. Now, coal has to disappear. Okay, Coal is incredibly dirty. We just need to get rid of that. And also you find that it has a huge impact on the landscape as well. So we can definitely write that off. Oil we will still need oil in the future because unfortunately we do need plastics. Plastics are so useful and also all the other things that we get out of crude oil such as the lubricants which means that wind turbines can actually turn. So there's still going to be some oil but actually as my friends who are chemists go the worst thing you can do with crude oil because it's so exciting is burn it. It's a waste. Okay. 
So I think we need to move away from that. And what was really interesting is this month, the International Energy Authority published their 1.5 degree report, which basically says there should be no new discovery or uh, looking for fossil fuels. We don't need any more. And their trajectory of fossil fuel use to get to a one and a half degree just literally just goes falls off the cliff. Now, of course, they've always supposedly been a spokes uh, group for the fossil fuel industry. So we're at a real change. We've, we've changing, changing the way big organizations think. So the days of the fossil fuel industry, as we know it, are really numbered. Yeah, and that's fantastic. That report has come out, and I'll, I'll put a link to that on, on, the, on the show notes. In your book, you also refer to the fact that since the beginning of civilization, we have actually cut down three trillion trees. Um, that's more than half the trees on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we previously spoke, um, a lot of that was obviously driven by the Industrial Re Revolution, but also um, after World War I, where, where wood was being used to make trenches and they started to run out of wood and they started the Forestry Commission, etc. But now, uh, a lot of the trees that are being cut down is actually being used for animal farming and animal feed. Uh, would you say that's correct? So we have a look at the history of deforestation. You start with the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago, and that's where land clearance occurs to clear land so you can have farmland. And that is a... Um, I would say, a process that's carried on even to today. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then you have different stresses at different countries. So the one you mentioned was that, of course, the UK got down to just 5% forest cover, which was incredible. And that was just after the First World War. And that was because we had cleared a lot of land for sort of uh, farming because we had an explosion of our population in the 19th century. We then cut a lot of trees, mainly oak trees, down to build ships to keep the French out uh, and to, of course, control our empire. And then, of course, there was the last vestiges of forest that were used for actually building the trenches in the First World War. So we have started to reforest, nowhere near as amazing as other countries, and we've gone from 5% to up to about 13%. But think about it. The average forest cover in a European country is 34%. So we have really changed our landscape. And the key thing is now the tropical deforestation that we're really worried about is being driven by wanting to clear land for things like soya and beef. And so therefore, you have this sort of burgeoning markets on um, people really wanting cheap meat um, all around the world. And the best and the cheapest way to do it is just take virgin rainforest, cut it down and basically put uh, cows on it. And that's not sustainable at all, makes a huge uh, impact on our uh, biodiversity. And of course, as you cut trees down, you can release all that uh, sort of like uh, carbon into the atmosphere. So there is a real strong argument around the world that we should be moving to a more vegetable-based diet. Um, that also improves everybody's health, and it has a really big impact on the planet because our need for cheap meat is driving massive destruction around the world. But the really good news is there is so much opportunity in the future for us to actually reforest and actually rewild vast parts of the planet. I mean, the only thing I believe that Donald Trump actually agreed to at the last Davos he went to was, yes, of course we should plant a trillion trees. And so this m mantra of plant trees has actually grown up as a really nice single uh, idea that people can um, grab hold of. Yeah, and I quite like these uh you know these startups that are coming up that are going to companies to say you know sponsor 
a tree, you know, and, and give that as a gift to your employees. Uh, well, I think there's also a big revolution happening in carbon offsetting and carbon credits, which a lot of people are quite rightly cynical about um, because the market hasn't evolved as quickly as the world has. And also there are lots of cowboys out there who uh, basically will sell you anything because they just want your money. And I always find this really strange when talking to sort of like brilliant business people and sort of like top CEOs because they turn around and go, I don't understand why are there sort of like uh, these sort of uh, awful people selling rubbish credits? I went, okay, in your speciality field, you have great companies like your own, but you know really rubbish ones, you know, that you wouldn't trust with a barge pole. And they, they go, yes. I went, so why is this market any different? And once they realize that it's a marketplace, they go, Oh, I see. And I said, yes. And it's a marketplace that is not properly regulated. And so that's something that I and Trove Research and colleagues at UCL are working on is to provide the data to clearly show how this global system of carbon offsetting should be governed and should be regulated. So you and I can actually buy credits for our companies knowing that when we buy a ton of CO2, that's a ton of CO2 that's actually been taken out of the atmosphere. And it will be monitored over the next 30 to 40 years to make sure that stays in the forest or the peatland that we've actually invested in. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, what are your thoughts on creating uh, carbon labeling for food products? So I'm in two minds for this because I think that it is really difficult to unpick the ethics because, yes, some foods that we get from overseas will have a higher uh, sort of carbon footprint. But actually, we really want that food because it's produced more sustainably and better in that country than our own and also you're very aware that those people need this export to support their own livelihood. So there's a real ethical problem here about carbon labeling and actually the ethics of sort of like supporting people around the world who are working in particularly agriculture. I think what is really helpful though is actually labeling foods properly about their content and actually getting government to really step in and go actually we're going to regulate food and actually help people i mean i could spend three hours in the supermarket picking up every single one and trying to work out how much salt how much sort of like it's really difficult and i think what we need is some regulation before the food even gets to the supermarket so you and i and people that want to do the right thing feed our families as healthy as possible, move to a much more vegetable-based diet, can actually have food that's there. Because we have to remember that most people are incredibly busy. Okay, They may be holding one, two, maybe even three jobs down just to try and actually pay their mortgage. They are trying to educate their kids with their homework. They're trying to make a, a, a sort of quick meal for them, etc., that's as healthy as possible. And actually, when you look at the supermarket, if you don't have much money, it is really easy just to go for the prepackaged sort of like uh, foods, processed. cheap meat, processed meat, etc., which has all the offcuts in it because it's cheap, it's got calories, and it's good for them. Um, and the problem is that we have got this whole thing, which is, oh, do I buy some cheap burgers or do I buy a single avocado? You know. We, we've got to that weird thing. And therefore, we need some, we just need help from government to basically say, no, let's actually balance this out. So when people who are challenged financially, who are having a really bad patch, and we all go through those, they can go in there and they can still buy healthy, nutritious food at a price that they can afford. Yes. And one of the things that you also spoke about in, in the book was to potentially ban advertising on unhealthy food. And I know 
looking at the UK government, that they are making steps in, in terms of change around uh, HFSS, which is high fat sugar and salt products. And they're actually going to be, um, um, especially in supermarket aisles, they're not going to allow those products to exist in other areas, like near near where you pay, uh, yeah. you know, for food, for example. Um, what do you think about that? And do you think that we should also be looking at banning ads for, say, meat and dairy? Uh, you know, all, all the cheap uh, meats that are causing a lot of damage to the environment. I mean, I think that we really have to think about our food. And I think it's also about messaging. So I don't think you need to ban chocolate adverts. Okay. You and I know that chocolate is a luxury good and it's bad for you. Okay. You know, okay. There might be some health uh, making you feel a bit better. So you don't have to tell people that's bad for you. Ice cream is bad for you. You know, cake is bad for you. We, we know that. That's fine. What really upsets me is the added sugar and the added salt into processed food and actually a lot of meat. And the thing is, you can compare some meat products and a cake and go, according to this, the cake is better for me. I mean, this is ridiculous <laughs> levels, okay? And I think that's where we need to sort of like help people, which is the hidden cost, the hidden damage that's being uh, are being allowed because people are trying to make their products cheaper and also taste nicer. And of course, we know that if you bung, bung a huge amount of salt into something, our taste buds are basically cheated and gone, Oh, that that doesn't taste like awful. It tastes quite good, you know. So I, I think I think we need some really thoughtful policies. And I think this is the thing about the whole of the climate change debate. It's messy. There are no simple fixes, but we need actually really positive, thoughtful policies. And one of the interesting things is I always say we need to include the lawyers. I, I know that sounds a strange thing. But there are so many incredible lawyers in universities and in firms who specialize in looking at how to build policies within the country's legal framework so they're successful. Because all of us can say, well, we can ban X. But if there's no framework to actually make and enforce it, then it's not going to work. So I think we really need to work really cleverly. And I think that's the key. Have clever policies that actually respect people's choice because i'm sorry if you want to go and buy yourself 10 bars of chocolate every day okay as i did when i was an undergraduate go for it okay but we also need to help people and not have things hidden from them so i think it's clever policy making we need and i guess you know the generations of the future are going to be so interconnected um with this level of information that can be deployed very quickly as it already is, right? So I think uh, your point about communication is crucial here. And once the policies are in place to communicate that fact that, you know what, look at whole foods, plant-based diets, is yep. gonna be a lot healthier for you. And it's also not gonna cause you issues in the future. You're gonna live longer. It's not gonna be a strain on the health system all that plays an important part and you're saving the planet at the same time. I mean, I also think that we need to change our aspirations and this, so the whole meat thing comes from that meat was a luxury item. So uh, when I was a kid, we had a Sunday roast. The reason being is that was the big purchase within the week's shopping. Okay. And that was it. And I remember that for the next few days, we would have, the offcuts from that we would have the cold meats etc because we would stretch that piece of meat out as long as possible and so therefore in everybody's psyche quite rightly and in most countries in the world meat is seen as a luxury good it is something that we aspire to but what we have now is a society which actually has flooded the market with cheap meat so you can have a roast dinner every day of the week if you want, because you might be, you probably be able to afford it. And so what we need to do is unpick that historic narrative and go, well, hang on, what is the aspiration? Well, actually, the aspiration should be 
to produce the healthiest, tastiest food, which doesn't necessarily include meat. And therefore, we need to move on people's aspirations. Because you see this around the world. What's happening is as countries develop, they look at other countries and go, hang on, I want to be able to have meat every sort of like uh, a day. They do. I want that luxury. And I think we need to try and unpick that narrative in some way. And again, this is where actually marketing and PR companies and the advertising sort of system really comes in because what you really want to be able to do is give people different aspirations, different uh, ideas of what the perfect family meal looks like. Yeah, totally. So thinking about individuals now, what can individuals do to make the most impact? So I think the first and the biggest impact is to talk about the climate change and environmental crisis that we're in. And people seem to be really reticent about it. We are happy to talk about whether the prime minister should have John Lewis furniture or not, you know, in his flat. <laughs> I mean, yeah. who cares? But we don't talk about the crisis. I mean, it's sort of like, it's one of those sort of things that sort of you go down the pub and you go, oh yeah, climate change, yeah, 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 let's not talk about it, you know. Uh, but again, as soon as people talk about it, and you see this in uh, communities, you see this in churches, you see this in sports groups, in companies, as soon as people talk about it, they go, well, hang on, you're right, this is really important. What can we do? What can we do to do it just a little bit? So that's my first thing, which is free yeah. yourself up. This is something we should all talk about. There are solutions. It is not this huge, frightening thing. There are lots of things we can do which are really positive. So that's the first one. In the book, the second one turns out to be, of course, move to a more vegetable-based diet. And this is where I deeply sympathize with people because, do you know what? I love my meat, okay? I, I'm with you, okay? I, I'm with people. And so what I say is it's a journey. It's a bit like going carbon yeah. neutral. You can't do it overnight, and I wouldn't want you to. So you have to ease into it. So start off be a, being a flexitarian. So basically, just have meat once a week as a, a special. You go, oh, you know, I really enjoy that. You know, and I've enjoyed it because it's special. And then perhaps you can eke it out to a month. And then basically, perhaps on your birthday, once a year, you go, I'm going for that top hamburger, you know, like that. And you have to and you have to take your family with you on that journey. And then, of course, once you're within a real vegetable based diet, then you can start to say, well, are there certain things I want to cut out? Do I want to move towards more the vegan diet away from the vegetarian diet? And, and again, it's just a journey. And if you slip up, and occasionally you just go, do you know what, I just have to have that piece of bacon, that's not a huge crisis. You don't have to beat yourself up about it, because it is the movement of everybody to, say, a 95% vegetable-based diet, which will make a huge impact on uh, how much uh, emissions come from all of that beef farming and all that meat farming. So I think people should see it as a journey and an aspiration, not something that they should beat themselves up about. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that's uh, very high up on your list uh, as well as the communication. And we, we definitely need to have more healthy debates about this situation that we're in. And um, would you also consider population control? So like having one less child. Uh, I know it's quite hard in, in some you know, some markets and developing markets, especially, and also to live car free, you know, there's so much that's gone on last year, with people getting into cycling, mm -hmm. e mobility, for example, you know, reducing airline flights, trans uh, Atlantic uh, air yep. flights, but also like buying into green energy, renewable energy, instead of, you know, traditional energy firms, if you need to maybe uh, and you can afford to do it right now if you do need a car to either get a more efficient one or, or buy an electric car, right? So all, all those things together yeah. with talking about it and, and the plant-based diet, would, would you say those are also crucial elements uh, right. to, to add? To 
<clears throat> okay, so there's about 20 questions in that one, but so let's unpick yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. No, no, that's I'm fine. Really not, no, no. I'm doing what you did in it's your book. Great. It's, I'm great. I'm in the it's great. It's <laughs> great. So, there are, again, so individual level, lots of things we can do. We can switch to a green tariff on our sort of energy suppliers. Now, what I would really like is the UK to switch to uh, the Finnish style. So what Finland said is everybody goes on to a green tariff, but you can opt out. And the thing is, the opt in is always, oh, I've got to make an effort. Oh, I have to switch to a green tariff. And opt out, it's like, I can't be bothered to opt out. It's fine. And so, again, I think that we need a sea change in the way we think about it, which is, well, hang on. Everybody should be on a green tower, but of course we'll give you the choice to opt out. So I think, and that will help people. And actually, as far as I can tell, when I've basically done the research, the green tower is about the same price as the normal tower. So I can't really see that there's going to be a big financial incentive to opt out. So I think that's really important. The idea that we can walk more, cycle more, use public transport more, absolutely. The medics love climate change because it means that we are getting more healthy. If you can switch your car to a hybrid or to an electric car, that's great. They are still very expensive, which I get frustrated because if government just put a little bit of a subsidy in there, we could actually do price matching. Or you regulate mm. and you already tax petrol and diesel cars so that they are more expensive. So there's lots of little tweaks you can do. So I think that's important. And actually, if we look at the government's plans uh, in the UK, we're all going to be driving electric cars in 10 years' time anyway. So time to get yeah. used to it. But yeah. I'm going to go back to the big one because you basically opened Pandora's box and sort of like <laughs> then moved on, which is population. Right. <laughs> population is a real ethical and moral minefield. So the first thing is you'll find lots of people, and this is a really nasty argument, go, oh, the reason we're in this environmental crisis and the reason we have climate change is because there's all these poor people having children. And they blame it all on population, which is absolute rubbish. If you look at life, si uh, life um, sort of style carbon emissions, 50% of them, come from the richest 10% in the world. Now, that isn't the richest 10% of countries. It's the richest 10% of people. So, for example, if you're in a developing country such as India, you'll find that most of the emissions are by the upper middle classes to the billionaires. Okay? Same with China. And so what's really interesting is climate change isn't really about good countries, bad countries. It's about rich people totally over consuming and that includes you and i okay so we're, we're in that top 10 percent very easily and then you have say the bottom half which basically emit less than five percent got it this is ridiculous yeah. so so basically telling poor people in poor countries not to have children because it's going to say absolute rubbish an average indian so that's all the rich and the poor put together emit about two tons of carbon per year, okay? In America, 16 tons per person per year, and in the UK, it's about seven tons per person per year. So you can see that people are not equally guilty for this issue. So this whole idea about limiting children as a way of controlling climate change is really nasty. And the other interesting thing is, as I told you, we generate $88 trillion every single year. We can support a much larger population on the planet. We already generate 10 billion people's worth of food. There's only 7.9 of us. So therefore, we already produce enough food now for the population that will be stable by 2050. But... There's still 825 million people going to bed feeling hungry every night because of poverty. They do not have money to buy food. So the interesting thing about food politics is it is not food available. 
availability because it is always available we've got huge amounts of food in the world it is the ability to be able to purchase it can you actually have a few pennies in your back pocket to actually buy food and in some people's lives their major purchase is trying to feed themselves every single day yeah and and it's also about the affordability of uh protein absolutely so when we talk about the 825 million people that feel hungry every night, that's just calories, okay? If we then talk to the medics who I work with who are brilliant, if we then talk about nutrition, oh my word, I mean, we're talking sort of like billions of people that do not get the right nutrition. So not only do they not get necessarily get enough protein, they don't get enough of the micronutrients and all those other things that we need to sustain and have a healthy body. I mean, the good news is that we have all the resources. We just have to work out how to actually share. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that, for me, is the greatest challenge of this century, which is how do we actually have a more equal global society and how do we actually share those resources among the current 7.9 billion now will be by 2050 10 billion one of the other things was to create this like universal income to to get these the people out of poverty and get the governments to support these so they can afford to buy healthy food there are two things we have to look at the first thing is the current system of uh econ the economics has really failed and i'll give you a wonderful stat for that 26 billionaires, including Bill Gates, who has a competitive book, uh, sort of like, which he seems to be handing out free from his foundation. Um, those 26 people own the same wealth as the bottom 3.7 billion people. So the bottom half of the world, the poorest people, there are 26 people, which is the same as a small coach, okay? 26, just 26 people have the same wealth. So that automatically tells you that the neoliberal system that came about in the late 80s and early 90s has skewed this distribution of wealth. And therefore, somehow we need to rebalance that so people actually have access to wealth. And the interesting thing is universal basic income and the other thing, universal basic services, are really important because what it says is, hang on, Everybody is part of a country. Everybody can actually make a contribution to generating wealth. So therefore, we should share the wealth. Therefore, everybody has access, if they need it, to a level of income that is, will sustain them. And it means that people can make choices. So they can say, OK, do you know what? I'm going to have to go on to basic income because I'm going to look after my aging parents. Or... People can go, do you know what? I've always wanted to be an artist. I'm going to try this and I'm going to build a community art center and try to actually engage people. It also works for other things like business because entrepreneurs, I have no idea how people set up companies. I was very lucky. I set up a company, but I was already employed by a university, so I could still feed my family. I do not know how entrepreneurs set up a company because most companies even if they're successful, do not make any money in the first five years. And most of CEOs I know, how do you actually feed yourself for the first five years and look after your family? So I think that's really interesting. So universal based income would allow people to be more entrepreneurial. They will be able to choose community and family over the need to go to work nine to five to actually pay their mortgage. And I think that's a really interesting concept. It also frees up people because people then break that cycle between work consumption. I've worked so hard. I've even worked the weekends. I'm going on this brilliant holiday or I'm going to buy two cars or I'm going to sort of like uh, go on to the internet and start buying clothes because I just need a a positive fix so it's a really good way of breaking that 
You do, however, have to actually have universal basic services. So for example, you need access to free healthcare, free education, because that also then inspires people. The other thing is, if people have universal basic income, they can go, do you know what, I'm going to change my career. I, I'm, do you know what, I'm just going to step out and I'm going to go back to university or I'm going to go and do an apprenticeship because I can be supported. And so it means people can be really dynamic and they can even say, hey, look, I'm going to go and do a master's in climate change at UCL with Mark. Is that an offer, Mark? Uh, for me? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You can do it part-time over two years, mate. That's <laughs> lovely. Whose job is it, I guess? And uh, you make a fantastic point there. I mean, whose job is it to promote this universal system, if you like? Would it be the UN who've got their sustainability goals to have no poverty being one of them? Uh, whose job is it to bring everyone together on this? Like all of these problems, actually, the heart of these uh, ideas is government. And what I think has been quite amazing about the pandemic is people have changed their view of government. So prior to COVID, you know, everybody was a bit down on government. You know, just, you know they just tax us. They just regulate us. You know, uh, we keep telling them that we want to break away. We want to have neoliberalism, etc. But suddenly this pandemic hit and people, normal people in the street, realize that the only people that actually care, and I have to say some care more than, uh, than others, is government. They're the only ones that basically step up and go, right, we're going to protect you. We're going to do lockdowns. We're going to try and get PPE. We're going to sort out the vaccinations. We're going to sort of like give you uh, money to actually try to keep you alive. Now, of course, had they yeah. got universal basic income, they wouldn't have had to have this furlough system. You know, th there would have been always that backdrop yeah. so people have i think changed their view they suddenly realize yeah. that governments are really useful <laughs> they actually look after people and they also look around the world and go actually some governments are so much better looking after their people than others you know i, I want that government <laughs> you know i want a yeah. new zealand government you know yeah exactly i, think, I yeah. going to say that yeah exactly so i think I think people really have changed their view about government. And I think that's a really important stage because it means that governments now can leverage crisis. Whenever yeah. there's a crisis, governments can change things for positive and people won't get too disgruntled. So this is the time around the world that people can go, well, actually, how do we make sure we don't have people starving if we have another pandemic? How do we actually change our policies? How do we ensure there's a safety net everybody and how do we actually share i would say the wealth around in a better way i mean one of the really scary sort of like uh, stories that came out which is from the times rich list which is of course pandemic all of us were struggling all of us were worried about our jobs and actually whether we will be able to pay the mortgage except the very richest people their wealth increased by 20 percent because they basically made money out of the pandemic. And this is, you see this in wars, the financial crash, etc. Rich people get richer. So we need some systems to actually say, I don't mind people being well off. But actually, they don't have to have billions. I mean, how many cars can you actually have? How many villas can you have? How many planes can you actually own? It's like, hang on a minute. We need to actually just do a rebalancing and actually move the actual money to share it out in a better way. I mean, why? Why in the fifth British country in the world, which is the United Kingdom, do we have food banks? Yeah, and, and it's astonishing how many food banks we have, right? Absolutely. I mean, they, they over the last 10 years, they have increased hugely. And weirdly enough, some people, when they're interviewed locally, actually think the government are setting up these food banks to help them. It's like, no, they're the ones that have caused this poverty and this increase in poverty, but there's so much money in the system, they could easily, happily lift everybody out of poverty if they wanted to. In a way, you know, the comparisons that governments have been 
made in terms of the spotlight for COVID-19, where you can see, well, New, New Zealand had this many cases and deaths. It's kind of like a league table. Yeah, and, yeah. and so other governments are looking at each other. And I think we probably need to sort of, um, I, maybe there is one already, where, where you can actually compare governments in terms of what happens to multiple factors, uh, health, diseases, how much is being uh, spent on, I guess, dietary changes yeah. uh, and promoting plant-based diets. Um, and all those factors can be just rolled into like this, this league table would be fantastic. Well, I think in many ways, the sustainable development goals, which the UN ha have set up and are trying to encourage countries to look at key indicators, that collects a huge amount of data. So that already starts to do that. And I think with climate change, what we're seeing is a collection of information that's looking at which countries are going to net zero first? How are they doing it? What are they actually doing to improve their sort of uh, green credentials? So I think there's lots of information out there now, which is starting to compare and contrast countries. So I think we, we're getting that data, um, but it's also, we have to be very careful because of course, certain countries are much wealthier than others. And therefore mm. there is a real thing, which is, they are the ones that should be the first movers. Those are the ones that should be showing the way. I mean, the in interesting thing is if the UK went climate zero, oh, sorry, carbon zero, say in just 15 years, okay, and just showed everybody how to do it, there is then that thing which is, well, hang on. They haven't damaged their economy. Actually, their economy has grown. Their people are healthier. And actually, some of them are even happier. Um, if they can do it so quickly, then other countries of the world go, well, we want a piece of that. And I think that's where we need real leadership to come out um, because countries are deeply competitive. It's also with companies. So there have been incredible announcements from big transnationals that are saying, we're going to do this with climate. We're going to go carbon neutral by 2030, et cetera. And what that does is it sets the gold standard and everybody else goes, well, if they're doing it, we need to actually up our ambition. And human competition is incredibly powerful. And that's what you need to harness. You need to use the government policies and incentives and taxation to build competition in to generate, uh, I would say, massive competition within the green economy. And so therefore all that incredible entrepreneurship, all that sort of uh, great technology that's out there, people like yourself setting up companies, etc., will go out and actually go for it. And um, on, the, on the company side, um, you know, you, you mentioned that corporations that actively manage and plan for climate change secure a 67% higher return uh, than companies that refuse to disclose their carbon emissions is like a fantastic point. Why wouldn't all companies be doing this? Well, I think there is inherent conservatism with a small c within companies. And I've been really fortunate. I've worked with a large number of companies from small startup fashion houses that are carbon negative to billion dollar um, sort of high tech uh, IT companies. And so I've been really uh, lucky to be on those journeys. And it is a journey. And there's, there's first it's like, oh, no, I don't think we, this is not really for us. We, this is not what we do. And then you get some passionate people within companies. And this is where individuals really make a difference. Because you will have one or two of these people, they sort of start talking to each other, they start to infect their work friends all around them. It starts to go, well, we can do this. You know, there's lots of really small things we can do. Why don't we get these sort of like estates part to actually move to a, a green tower? That's a small tick, you know. And that slowly bubbles up and actually infects the CEO. There's also another effect that's going on because CEOs now are very aware that there is a new generation of people coming through who they want to employ. And actually, they think very differently, which is, okay, they want a good job, they want uh, to have a decent salary, but they 
know that they're good enough, that they will work for a company that they trust the ethic and moral background of the company. And so they're not going to walk into a company that has nothing to do with climate change and actually don't care about their own footprint. And so even hard-nosed CEOs that you and I all know who basically, you know what, it's, like it's, it's the bottom line. They just care about the profit. That's fine. That's why they're a CEO and I'm not, okay? That's brilliant. But they're also looking at the bottom line going, actually, all this talent that I want to bring in, if I don't change my company and I don't make it sort of like ethical and actually we really care about sort of uh, the environment at the same time, they're not going to come in. And therefore, I'm going to lose all that talent. And they also look externally and go, well, hang on, consumers now are saying, actually, I don't trust you, okay? Uh, and I, actually, I don't want to buy your products. I'm going to go and buy some sustainable fashion, or I'm going to buy some actually uh, sustainable organic uh, food. I'm not going to buy your stuff. And so therefore, th there's this balancing act which says, okay, even if a company hasn't got it in their DNA, there is those two twin uh, sort of pressures. You also find that government has been really clever. So there's lots of things that people don't realize. If you want to bid for a government contract in the United Kingdom or in many countries around the world, you have all the usual tender documents and then you have your sustainability development and say, well, how is this project going to be sustainable? How are you going to offset your carbon? And then also they say, do you have all the ISOs? Do you have all the numbers? Do you have it all ticked? And so their companies are being forced to ensure that they have all those environmental uh, credentials before they can even bid for these big government projects. So there's lots of really interesting incentives as well that's going on. Yeah. Would that exclude some of the some of the startup companies that aren't there yet um, that maybe have managed just to get their B Corp status, for example, um, you know, but they want to be able to go in there and then maybe they don't have all the standards. So it's like, I guess only the big companies that have the amounts to spend will end up winning those contracts. I don't think so because one, as a smaller company, filling out those ISOs is much easier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> trust me, having, having gone through billion dollar companies, they go, okay, so we, we need the India office to actually provide us for this data for all the actual out and Scandinavia and, and putting that together. Whereas if you're a small operation, much easier. Also, I think because small companies are lighter on their feet, they can do more innovative things much quicker. So thinking about energy and future sort of energy needs, something that you write in a book is uh, that we need to move to fusion energy. So I've been, been looking into this and at the moment there's a, you know, it requires a lot of investment from, from multiple countries to, to get there. And there's a number of projects that are happening. Uh, UK government, for example, just announced their intention to look at a plant in Nottinghamshire to create a fusion energy plant. And effectively, it's, you know, taking these hydrogen atoms and, and fusing them together to get helium atoms. And that in that process, it loses a lot of mass. And that's what creates the energy, right? But it's still very much hasn't been proven out yet. But there's so much investment going into it. But I can see how it's also, it could lead to a, a very green, clean energy because um, it's four times as efficient than, say, uh, fission uh, energy, which is the old nuclear technology, but also four million times as coal and gas, for example. So what are your thoughts around, I guess, like, are we getting there? You know, is it going to happen? Um but also, should should we reconsider that actually it might not happen in our lifetime, um, and that we need to look at future generations? That this is tech that we need to invest in. And I've always loved this quote, which is fusion was the great hope for the last 50 years and will be the great hope for the next 50 years. It is something that we know technically can work. It is just that key thing, which is how do you scale it up? How do you actually make it function within society? And I think that's something we need to actually consider. 
But I think we should step back and actually say, well, actually in the short term, we don't need fusion, okay? We have all the renewable technologies that we can actually uh, deal with. The price of that has dropped markedly. Solar panels, wind, wave, you know, biofuels. So therefore, at the moment, the transition from fossil fuel energy production to renewables is possible and cost effective. And that's the first stage we should do. But we should be really conscious that by 2050, there will be 10 billion people on the planet. They will all demand to have access to a lot of energy. One of the key rules of history and of humanity is our need for energy just goes up every single year. Okay, Even in developed countries, we're still consuming more energy every single year because, of course, of our laptops, our flat screen TVs, etc., etc. And, of course, that's going to get even more because we're all going to be charging our electric cars. So, absolutely. So, for me, if we're looking at the middle of the century, fusion would be an incredible technology to have to fuel countries, to produce clean, safe electricity for countries as a demand grows. And so we should be investing in it. And what people forget is some of the great technologies in the world took huge amounts of investment. So one of the things people don't realize is kerosene, which is a brilliant, brilliant piece of technology, okay? It's liquid, it's safe. I mean, you can slosh it around, it doesn't blow up, etc. You can stick it on a jumbo jet and it is so powerful that it throws that piece of metal up into the air and across the Atlantic. I mean, we forget. But actually, the Americans spent more money, about twice as much money, developing kerosene during the Second World War than they did the nuclear bomb. And people forget that. So, again, actually, when new technologies, which are difficult, come online, yes, we have to invest in it. And I think... People have argued that we sort of have to have that wartime sort of financing to actually try to make that those things work. Also, because I'm uh, a child of the 70s, I'm still obsessed with the space race. And for me, actually, if we're going to get anywhere in space, and hopefully we are going back to the moon soon, because um, according to me, when, when I was a child, we were supposed to have a moon base by 2020, you know, sort of like we were supposed to be already on Mars by now. You know, what happened? You know, we lost 30 years. So again, fusion will be really, really essential if we're going to be able to actually move and actually move into sort of like solar exploration. Yeah. And looking at finally, I guess, uh, carbon capture, um, which projects have you seen that you're really uh, excited about? So one of the most exciting pieces of carbon capture is basically reforestation or rewilding. I mean, people always think down the Bill Gates, um, suck it out of the atmosphere, etc. Well, yeah, but actually we have wonderful vegetation that does that. And people don't realize that we've already done some of these huge experiments. So in China, at the beginning of the 1990s, they were really worried because the western part in the foothills of the Himalayas was starting to become a dust bowl. And this was really worrying because that had been the uh, food basket of China for thousands of years. And it was basically being overworked. So, of course, the Chinese government asked their scientists, what's gone wrong here? What should we do? And they just went, plant trees. So the Chinese government literally went to farmers and said, right, you will be planting trees here, 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 here. If you cut one down, you're in prison for 25 years. Go for it. But they're also sneaky because this was this classic win-win, which I'm always talking about in the book, because the government was really aware that the rich East and incredible poverty in the West. So they wanted somewhere moving money across the country. So what they actually said to the farmers is like, you will plant these trees and you will take this money. And so what they did was then improve the environment and they replanted 100 million 
hectares. I mean, this is just incredible. And you can see that from space, the greening of uh, Western China. And actually what it did was stabilize the soils, tick. Uh, it stopped flash flooding, tick. Stabilized the rainfall because of course those trees started to put uh, moisture into the atmosphere through transpiration. So it stabilized the rainfall, made it more regular. And of course, boosted agricultural production. And you see that in the western part of China and lots of places in India, because you have small farms with lots of trees around, the product productiveness of that land is much higher than when you have those huge fields you see in the Midwest and the USA, which is monoculture, and they keep having to add huge amounts of um, sort of nutrients to it. Um, and so there, there is that difference there. So for me, if you want to have big carbon capture projects, reforest the world, we need another trillion trees on the planet. Hey, look, we cut down three trillion. So we know the planet can quite happily hold that. And what's really interesting is that, and this is something that people don't get because it seems to be counterintuitive. Our population is increasing. And so we will get to 10 billion by 2050. But actually, most of them will be in cities. So the weird thing is the world is becoming a wilder place. <laughs> so there is more places that we can actually uh, look after, rewild, actually reforest. Even though our population is going up, we actually want to live in dense urban environments. And so therefore, even though it's odd that our population is going up, but we have more space to actually plant trees and look after the planet. That's fantastic. Yeah, we spoke about so many awesome things today. So just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and speaking so highly about all of these items. It's always a pleasure. And I have to say, um, I just hope these sort of like chats that we have can inspire people just to improve their little bit of the world, you know, improve their sort of like their community or what they do in their family, or actually perhaps they're going to be one of these irritants within a company that actually starts to actually change the culture of the company, which of course will make it more profitable, but it will also make it a better place to actually work. Yes, fantastic. I hope so too. So thank you again. Until next time, great to see you and uh, see you soon. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Take care.